Welcome to the Manga Bay Newscast. It's July 28th, 2021, and I'm your host, Mike Gorecki, bringing you the news and inspiration from Nature's Frontline. World Elephant Day is August 12th, which means it's fast approaching. So today we're going to look at some of the latest projects and research informing conservation of one of the world's most recognizable and beloved animal species, which also happens to be the world's largest land animal. There are three types of elephants in the world, all of which are endangered. There is the Asian elephant and two species found in Africa, the bush elephant and the forest elephant. We'll be talking about the African species today. Our first guest is National Geographic photographer and documentary filmmaker Amy Vitale, who has recently made a short film called Shaba about an elephant rescued by the indigenous-led Reteti Elephant Sanctuary in Kenya. Vitaly tells us about how Shaba the elephant overcame the trauma of watching poachers kill her mother right in front of her to become the first matriarch elephant at the Reteti Sanctuary. Vitaly also tells us about the Samburu people, especially the Samburu women, who run the sanctuary with extreme love and dedication. And she also tells us how you can watch her new short film that tells the story of Shaba and Reteti. Plus, she lets us in on a little surprise that's in store for those who seek out the film on World Elephant Day. Our second guest today is John Polson, an associate professor at Duke University here in the U.S., whose work as a tropical ecologist and conservationist has focused on Central Africa for over 20 years. Polson tells us about his recent research into the movements of African forest elephants in Gabon and how that can help inform conservation strategies for the critically endangered species. So many of us, particularly in the Western world, we grew up having, you know, stuffed elephants or seeing elephants as cartoon characters. And so I think there's a natural love for elephants. I think people, in, to some extent, I don't know if they identify with them, but they, they s- certainly appreciate them. But I think oftentimes there's a disconnect between these characters, these stuffed animals that we've grown to love and the actual natural world. And so I think things like World Elephant Day are great for raising raising knowledge about the, the plight of the elephants and the fact that they really, their populations, both savanna and in particular forest elephants, are in decline and in real danger. Amy Vitale's new short film is called Shaba, after the elephant that plays the leading role in the story the film tells. But Shaba's real star just might be the elephant keepers of Reteti Elephant Sanctuary, the first indigenous-owned and run elephant sanctuary in Africa. The Samburu people have lived on the land in northern Kenya where the sanctuary is located for hundreds of years, but Reteti was founded just five years ago. It's already at the forefront of a global community-based conservation movement, however, and once you've seen Vitaly's Shaba film, you'll understand why. Not only is the cinematography absolutely gorgeous, which certainly helps draw the viewer in, but the Reteti Elephant Keeper's joy and commitment to their work is absolutely infectious. You can see for yourself by going to shabafilm.org and purchasing a ticket to watch the film on demand up until World Elephant Day on August 12th. Once you've finished watching it, I can guarantee you'll be happy to know that all proceeds from ticket sales are going directly to benefit Reteti Elephant Sanctuary. Here's Vitaly herself to give us the scoop on what the film is all about. This film is something I have been working on since the very, very beginning of the Reteti Elephant Sanctuary. And what makes Reteti incredibly unique is that it is the first sanctuary that is owned and run by the indigenous community, the Samburu community. It's the first of its kind in the world. And the other thing that really makes it so special is it also hires indigenous Samburu women to be elephant keepers, which is really unusual, unheard of in in that culture. And, And also throughout Africa, it's the first sanctuary that hires indigenous women. And this story about Shaba is not just a story about this extraordinary elephant named Shaba who arrived as this traumatized two-year-old whose mother had been killed by poachers. She witnessed her mother being shot in front of her and she was angry and, as I said, traumatized and came into the sanctuary, you know, as a pretty big elephant. You know, she was not a young baby. She actually had strength and 
Uh, it was really, it was really a, a tumultuous situation when she first arrived because she wanted to kill everybody. She humans were her enemy, and this story is a story about not just this elephant, but the unique relationship and the deep bonds that were formed between the women keepers and and Shaba. And and it's this story about fear, about overcoming fear and our connections to one another and to the wildlife that we coexist with. It's a really moving story that I had the privilege of witnessing. A moving is definitely the right word. At the risk of giving away some spoilers here, there's a part of the film where Shaba and the herd of orphaned elephants she becomes matriarch to at the sanctuary have been released back into the wild. And I literally got teary watching the keepers at Reteti celebrating when the orphaned herd finally linked up with a wild herd. It was really just that beautiful and touching to see how much the keepers at Reteti care for the elephants they rescue. You know, I'm I'm crying right now because if you knew the the keepers and everything that they went through, they were it was actually a mixture of joy and sadness, but they understood that, you know, that these animals have to go back to the wild, but they have developed these extraordinary bonds. And and in fact, this one elephant, Shaba, she did become the matriarch and she ended up teaching the keepers as much as, you know, anybody. She taught them how to be elephant keepers. She she taught all of those babies how to be wild elephants and took care of them. And every time a new elephant came in, she would smell them and come tearing through, you know, these the the landscape because she knew that a new baby had arrived and she would barge into, you know, they have these stables where they bring the babies and she would barge in with a whole herd of orphaned babies behind her to go and comfort the new baby. And I have to say the first few babies that arrived it was the most remarkable thing to witness because she would first come in and reach her t- trunk in through, you know, the enclosure to smell them and comfort them. And then afterwards, it was, you know, I don't want to try to interpret what the elephant was thinking, but it really seemed like she would get angry. She would trumpet and literally bang her head trying to get into that enclosure. And I also will give away one other piece of the film. She actually tried to harm the keepers in the beginning. They had to create a wall of tires and put themselves into the tires to be able to feed her milk. Because, you know, as I said, she was a big elephant and she could kill them if she wanted to. And so they had to first gain her trust. And so this story is just such a, it's a powerful story because they're incredibly intelligent creatures and you start to feel and recognize those bonds that she created both with the baby elephants, but also with her human caretakers. It's a short film. It clocks in at about 11 minutes, I believe, but there is a lot packed into those 11 minutes. And the cinematography is really incredible, too, I would just like to say. Well, thank you so much. You know, it's been this extraordinary you know, journey. And, and really, I have to back up and tell you a little bit about the sanctuary. I mean, it was, it was just a dream for a long time. And, and people thought that they were crazy and that they, they'd never be able to make an elephant sanctuary. But in fact, they did. And I kind of stuck by them from the very beginning and, and really realized that this was going to happen. And um, and it's been this emotional journey also watching the, the, the people kind of become really proud of what they're doing and confident. And, you know, in the beginning, they were shy and quiet. And I would ask, for example, I'd ask some of the women a question and they could barely whisper an answer. And if you see them today, they are so confident and, you know, it, it really is this journey I think this is the story about all of us. It's a story about overcoming our fears of one another, of wildlife, of the wild, really. And um, yeah, and right now, I just hope that the listeners just take the time because the, 
were doing, you know, they, they really struggled during the pandemic. There were a lot of, you know, they, they rely on tourism and donations to keep that sanctuary going and all of it just stopped. And, and so I'm hoping that this film can be a way for people to learn about the sanctuary and all of the tickets, the, they will become direct donations to the sanctuary. Yeah, so proceeds from the film are benefiting Rotetti. Yeah, so it's really, it was always meant to be a fundraising tool for them to tell the story. And there's honestly so many stories I could tell, but I, I really did focus on the story of, of the bonds between this one elephant, Shaba, who's since gone back to the wild. People always ask, how is she doing? She, she is doing really well and she's still the matriarch of all. They've already released 10 elephants back to the wild that were orphaned and they rescued them, rehabilitated them. And it's taken now six years for the sanctuary to be able to return elephants back to the wild because you can't actually send them back after they've been orphaned right away. You have to wean them off of the milk formula. And so they have to get old enough to be able to be weaned and sent back. And that's why an elephant like Shaba taking the matriarch role is so important, right? Because she had to actually teach all the younger elephants how to be wild elephants. Yeah, exactly. So humans, you know, we, we, all the love in the world that we can give them isn't actually enough. They, they need to learn. It needs to be a mixture in a way. The human nannies come and feed them milk formula every three hours around the clock, day and night, every day. And, um, and then the, elephants, you know, a new matriarch has stepped up but um, and taken the role of, of Shaba, but Shaba really taught them. It was so interesting to watch, honestly. She, I spent so much time just with them in the wild, and Shaba would, you know, once there was an elephant that, a little baby that arrived named Bawa that would just follow Shaba and just walk right behind her, just hanging onto her tail sometimes. And, um, and it got really dry and there was a big ditch from erosion that had, had formed and Shaba was walking down this ditch. And then she, you know, it's about like, I don't know, five feet deep. And she just takes a step and gets out of the, the ditch. But there's this baby that is then stuck in the ditch and doesn't know how to get out. And Shaba is walking away. And then all of a sudden, she realizes that Bawa is stuck in the ditch. She literally does a 180, drops down onto her knees and starts moving her, she's on her knees, moving them to show Bawa how to get out of the ditch. And I mean, it was just little things like that, that I just, it, it's so amazing to watch. She teaches them how to find the best browse material, like how to browse on the wild food, how to, you know, how to, who her, pred how, who the predators are, who, you know, how to get out of ditches, things like that. And then it was so, there were just so many stories. And another really beautiful story is that one of the keepers had a wound that was going septic. She hadn't treated it. She was so busy focusing on the elephants. And elephants, the way they take care of themselves is if they have an injury, they pack their wound with mud. And one day, this elephant that's also gone back to the wild named Worgus noticed that this keeper had a wound. And she went over and got mud from the mud bath and started packing the wound on the human and then she went back again and got more mud and packed the wound again. And if it weren't for her, the keeper probably would have ignored that wound and it could have become very serious. But there's so many beautiful stories like this that just, you know, over time you start to witness their relationships with each other. And then the keeper told me, you know, I realized then that it wasn't just me saving these elephants. The elephants are actually saving us too. So poaching is, of course, a threat to elephants across Africa. But where do the elephants at Riteti typically come from? Traditionally, in the past, there was one elephant sanctuary in outside of Nairobi, the Sheldrick's sanctuary. And 
that usually all the elephants from all across Kenya would go there. But the truth is, there are these elephants that live up north and they're much, you know, it's a different climate, a different, totally different landscape. They, um, they're even smaller and they, um, they live in these dry, dusty landscapes and have a totally different diet. And, and so now because of Riteti, these elephants will be able to stay in their same landscape. In the past, they had to be flown all the way to Nairobi and then they get released into an entirely different part of Kenya. And that means that they'll never have the opportunity to really link up with their own herds again. The hope is that one day these elephants will find their own herds again. The other great thing about Riteti is that all of these elephants, you know, they don't all go to the sanctuary. Very often they can rescue them and and reunite them with their own herd right there at the at the place they find them. So what happens is a team goes out from Riteti and they will wait for, I think it's about 72 hours with the baby that's been orphaned. And very often the herd comes back and they just keep the baby there safe from predators and then the herd comes back and it reunites right there. And so it's only after that 72 hour period goes by and the herd hasn't come back or the herd can't be located that the elephant is brought to the sanctuary? Exactly. So after 72 hours so after 72 hours if if the herd has not come back, the mother hasn't come back, they do end up taking it back to the sanctuary where they at least have a place to take it and resuscitate it. And once an elephant is brought back to the sanctuary, how much do the keepers at Riteti rely on traditional Samburu knowledge versus Western science? I think that that actually a lot of the knowledge is really traditional knowledge. They've taken great effort to study wild elephants and watch what are they eating, you know, and trying to put some of the the same things that the babies would eat in the wild into the milk formula. And so they, you know, they have a really unique way of uh, creating the, the milk formula, which is, you know, in the past, all the babies would get the same exact milk formula, but in this case, the the new orphans that arrive, they really study the babies. They look at, you know, its dung and 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 its health and monitor it, and they try to adapt the formula to suit each baby. But you know, where Western science comes in, um, the San Diego Zoo actually brought in a scale for the babies, and so they weigh the babies every single day to monitor their health, their weight, to see how they're progressing. There, um, you know, there's a relationship with the veterinarians, and and I think you know, I think it's been a really beautiful blend of of really using some traditional knowledge and, and, you know, Western science and trying to figure out the best way. They're doing a lot of new studying, really just learning a lot from this sanctuary about how babies are rescued and, and how do you successfully reunite them back to the wild. You, of course, already touched on this, but can you say a bit more about the importance of the fact that women are key to running Rateti? You know, I focus my film on the women keepers just because they are so unique, but I will say it's run by extraordinary men and women, and there's about 50 keepers now working there. It's completely transformed, you know, the the community. All of the keepers come from the Samburu community, so it's giving them opportunities that they never had before. And what is so special about this place is, you know, it's really about their relationship to the wild and understanding that these wild animals are important for their own destiny and livelihoods. And, and it's, it's really something I've never seen anywhere else. I mean, what they have created is so unique. And there's one other piece of the story, which I really love, which came from the pandemic. Here's a hopeful story from the pandemic. You know, we all have heard these sad stories of the last year and a half. But 
what happened at Ritetti was that um, they they had been importing milk formula that, you know, it's the, the canned powdered milk formula that we feed human babies. And they that's what they use to feed the elephants. And because of the pandemic, there were shortages in, in the supply of the milk formula. And so they began to experiment and use local fresh goat milk from the community. And it turned out being this huge success story. Not only did the baby elephants respond really well, they have a 100% success rate. So no babies died that came in during the pandemic that started drinking the goat milk formula. It was so successful that they've now completely transformed the whole recipe for the milk formula. So the babies get the the goat's milk. And the best part about it is that now all that money that was going to buy expensive milk formula from outside of Kenya is now going directly to the women in the community who go and milk their goats. And so it's like this whole economic benefit that nobody knew about. And, you know, they didn't want to ever change the formula because it was working before. And it was only because of the pandemic that they they had the opportunity to reimagine and experiment. And I think it's just this other kind of beautiful takeaway from these moments when things seem, you know, when when we're ready for change. I feel like when these difficult moments come, if you're willing to adapt and find new answers, it's just this beautiful kind of metaphor for all of us. Like we can often find our best discoveries in our most challenging moments. So tell our listeners how they can watch Shaba the film and thereby support the Ritetti Elephant Sanctuary. I think anybody listening, if you're still listening, there's a great a way to support it. You can actually just buy a ticket and it's at www shabathefilm.org and you can become engaged and learn all about the sanctuary. You can follow them on Instagram at rescue. It's r.e.s.c.u.e. So it's rescue with dots in between every letter and follow them on Instagram, follow them on Facebook. They love seeing your comments. I think it really energizes and helps create more pride for the work that they're doing because it's hard work. They've committed their lives to living with these elephants and rescuing them. And yeah, and I think it becomes a blueprint for so many other places. If you're feeling down about the world, go watch this film, get engaged with them. They are truly heroes. And I think we'll, it's hard not to be inspired by them. That's what makes me feel motivated. And, you know, I, I work hard every day because they inspire me. And if I'm not mistaken, there's some sort of special promotion for World Elephant Day? Yeah, so we are we have a surprise on World Elephant Day. If you love Dave Matthews, the musician, he actually made the music in the film, and he, he has an elephant song that is featured at the end of the film. And he is a great supporter of Ritetti and was with them from almost the very beginning. So he... Um, yeah, there's a surprise on World Elephant Day that involves Dave Matthews. And yeah, <laughs> tune in and, and you'll learn more by, by August 12th. Awesome. Thanks for that. And just for our listeners, again, it's shabathefilm.org. That's S-H-A-B-A, thefilm.org. How many elephants has Ritetti rescued, by the way? Well, I believe the last time I checked, it's over 35 elephants that they've rescued. They've already sent 10 back to the wild. And, you know, I think the, the, the other thing I want to point out is that Kenya is actually incredible. Only one of those elephants arrived because of a poaching incident. They've been making great headway in the poaching crisis because of governments working with, you know, communities and conservation groups and enacting stronger, harsher laws against poachers that are caught. So the truth of the matter is 
The greatest threat to elephants in Kenya today is climate change. Climate change is really creating more human-wildlife conflict. These elephants fall into wells because the wells get deeper as the climate gets more difficult, as the droughts get longer. And I, I just think that is our biggest threat going forward. Well, I know you're involved with a number of other conservation projects like the New Big Five, which is an initiative that seeks to establish a new Big Five of wildlife to be photographed instead of the traditional Big Five, which is five large African mammal species considered the most dangerous game for trophy hunters. What can you tell anyone who buys a ticket to watch the Shaba film, but who still wants to do more? So if you're interested in this story, there are so many more stories and ways to get engaged and not feel hopeless about the world. Right now, there's projects like the New Big Five, which is this wonderful idea by Graham Greene to, you know, to create interest in in other species that need our help right now. And if you're interested in prints, um, we do fundraisers. We're going to do another big fundraiser right before Christmas for uh, Ritetti and other grassroots organizations doing amazing works. There's a print rates print fundraiser going on right now called Prince for Wildlife that I also contribute to. But I would just say, you know, I think we have to channel when we feel any despair about the world, channel it into being active. And it takes that, you know, that despair away. And I feel like the future of this planet is really about having stubborn optimism because there's so many amazing people and great work that you don't often hear about. But Ritetti Elephant Sanctuary is definitely one way to feel hopeful about the future. Before you head off to shabathefilm.org, stick around just a little longer and hear about some of the latest research that's helping conservationists in Gabon devise strategies to protect critically endangered forest elephants. Tropical ecologist and conservationist Jeff Polson is based at Duke University, but he's had a hand in two recent studies of forest elephants in Central Africa that he'll tell us about today. There are two species of elephant in Africa, of course, the endangered bush elephant and the critically endangered forest elephant. I asked Polson to set the stage for us a bit by explaining some of the differences between the two species and what makes forest elephants unique. There's, of course, two different species now. Uh, They were just recently recognized. Uh, For the longest time, there was only one species of African elephant, even though uh, since around 2000, most most scientists in particular and geneticists recognized that there was a a forest elephant and a savanna elephant, also called the bush elephant. The forest elephants are found in West and Central Africa in the forested regions of those countries or of those uh, regions. And, of course, the distribution is... Uh, whereas the whereas forest elephants were found throughout those forested regions in the past, um, the distributions are much much uh, reduced, be- largely because of poaching and, and to some extent also habitat destruction and reduction. Um, the big difference, well, there's there's several differences between uh, forest elephants and savanna elephants. Uh, savanna elephants are, are much larger. They tend to move in much larger groups. And they're the elephants you picture when you think of safaris and going to Kenya or Tanzania or something like that. Forest elephants, um, as I said, are a bit more diminutive. They travel in smaller groups. Um, we actually, a, a PhD student just graduated of mine, Amelia Meyer, did work on their group size and, and found that they the group size is around three, three to four, um, which is much lower than savanna elephants in general. Forest elephants also have smaller ears. They have smaller tusks than, than uh, savanna elephants. So if you put the two side by side, in most situations, you, could, you could, would be able to distinguish the difference between the two of them. Another big difference between forest and savanna elephants is that forest elephants, of course, live in tropical forests. Uh, One of the reasons probably for them being shorter in stature um, and, of course, differences in their behavior and and group size. And the fact that they live in the forest means that they have different habits, ecological habits. Uh, Their diet consists 
to a much greater extent than savanna elephants of fruit in particular. And I guess the other, the other um, big difference between forest and savanna elephants is that forest elephants have been studied to a lot less extent than savanna elephants. Their savanna elephants have been studied for decades now, and we know a lot about their behavior, uh, their ecology, their distribution. Because forest elephants are more secretive, they're harder to see because they're in the forest and walking through a tropical forest, uh, most of the time you can see maybe 10, maybe 20 meters away from you. And so um, you certainly can't be in a in a wagon or a truck watching the behavior of, of the elephant. And so it's very hard to study forest elephants. So we don't know the full extent of the similarities or dissimilarities in ecology and behavior between the two species as we would hope to. And so hopefully that's what we're working, that's what we're working to do is to try to figure out how similar or dissimilar they are, um, which can tell us a lot about their needs and hopefully their conservation. Like you mentioned, poaching and habitat destruction are major threats to African forest elephants. Can you tell us a bit about how that's impacted their population numbers? When was the peak of their population and how many are there now? Yeah, this is a really important issue. The peak of their population numbers um, was, well, the peak of their population numbers would, would have been before the 1900s, right? Um, before, certainly before pre-colonial times when there was um, much less human impact um, on, on eco- ecological systems. Since colonial times and the trade of ivory, all, all elephant species uh, have, been, have been heavily hunted by humans for largely for their tusks. And there have been kind of different, different waves of population reduction and population increase in, in elephants across Africa. Um, and there is, in, if I'm getting this right, um, I don't have a timeline in front of me, but there was an initial reduction a large scale reduction in elephant populations in the 1970s and 80s and then and then um, scientists recognized this and they they pushed for conservation and so elephant populations started increasing at least savanna elephants now forest elephant populations weren't really known so it was hard to know whether they were increasing or decreasing so things were seemed to be getting better in the 1990s and then in the 2000s things got a lot worse um, largely uh, driven by again hunting for or poaching for ivory, a lot of the trade, not all of it, but a lot of the trade of ivory or or the um, the transfer of ivory was going to Asian countries, um, and so there have been a couple of seminal papers, one by Fiona Mazels and the Wildlife Conservation Society, that found between 2000 and 2010. Forest elephant populations decreased by 60, roughly 60% or 63%, which was a dramatic decline um, and maybe not entirely expected because people, people didn't have a good eye on what was going on with, um, with forest elephants. Some of this was poaching. A lot of it was poaching, I should say. Um, there was some effects of habitat destruction, just, you know, um, the the development of timber concessions, the development of roads and that sort of thing, um, greater urbanization. And some of it was also due to conflict, particularly in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And so the Democratic Republic of Congo in particular had really lost a lot of its, a, a large part of its elephant population. Uh, through the the study that um, Maisels et al. did, they found this enormous decline and they determined that most of the of the remaining elephants were probably located in the country of Gabon, which is on the western side of the of the continent in an area I like to call the armpit of Africa because it's at that little curve um, and it's right on the equator. So we did, my lab did um, with the Gabon Parks Agency, uh, sorry, the National Gabon Parks Agency, um, we did a study of forest elephant pop- the forest elephant population in Minkebe National Park in the northern part of the country. And Minkebe National Park was notable because it had been the known or renowned for having the highest density of forest elephants anywhere. So of all the locations across Central Africa, it was it was thought to have the highest densities. And so we did a study there with field work in 2015-2016 and compared it to past um, censuses that had been done in the early 2000s and found that there was a decline 
of roughly, again, 60 to 70 percent of the forest elephants in that national park. So even Gabon, which had had sort of been identified as the one last refuge for for forest elephants that was thought to hold 50 percent of the remaining population, had also been decimated by poaching. And in this case, we know most of the poaching came from uh, Cameroonian poachers who were crossing the border in the north, coming in. They were doing other things such as illegal gold mining, um, but also killing elephants and taking the ivory. And then the ivory was being shipped off to to all parts of the world, but lar- but largely Asia and to a large extent probably China. And do we have a good estimate of the total number of African forest elephants left in the world? Because they are listed as critically endangered on the IUCN red list, right? Yeah, we don't we don't have a good number right now. Um, and currently within in Gabon, there are scientists, the Gabon Parks Agency and Wildlife Conservation Society are working on, are doing a census of forest elephants in Gabon. The field work has been completed for a couple of years, so I think they're doing the analysis. So I suspect that in the next uh, year or two, we'll have a much better idea of what the exact number is. Um, and they really were focusing on uh, Gabon, because that's where the highest density of elephants is, uh, forest elephants is thought to still remain. You've done research into how declining forest elephant numbers not only impacts the species' risk of extinction, but also impacts forests to a large degree because of the elephants' role as ecosystem engineers. Can you tell us a bit about that and how the decline of forest elephants might impact forests? Certainly. Um, one thing you have to remember about forest elephants, elephants in general, of course, but forest elephants in particular, is that they're the, they're the largest terrestrial mammal, and therefore they consume a lot. <laughs> they consume a lot of vegetation. They consume a lot of fruit. In the case of forest elephants, um, they consume a lot of water. So they walk around the forest um, because of their size. Um, they make paths in the forest. So if you walk through a Central African forest that has forest elephants, in some cases you can see what look like really well-traveled roads or, or large trails. And this is the impact of the elephants walking along these trails over time, probably going to f- to preferred fruit trees or something like that. And so, and as they're moving along these trails, they're browsing, they're browsing on branches, they're browsing on vegetation. In some cases, they're stripping trees of bark. And so they're having a physical effect on the forest. And you can, you can see this in the structure of the forest. So if you go to forests with and without elephants, you can notice a visible difference. Without elephants, there's lots of, of small trees, lots of stems. It's a lot it's a lot less open. With elephants, the forest tends to be much more open. You can see farther. There are fewer small trees and more bigger trees. So just knowing this, having seen these having seen this by walking through the forest, this has uh, led us to to do a little bit of research into all the different impacts that 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 elephants can have on the forest. And so in addition to browsing, in addition to walking through the forest and have, and creating this physical impact, they're also well-known seed dispersers. So when they eat fruit, they swallow the seeds, and then they carry off the seeds some distance and, and then essentially plant the seeds through, through defecating, um, through their defecations. So there's been some research done on seed dispersal by elephants, and actually we're working on a paper now that's looking at seed dispersal by elephants. And what we do know is that uh, they've been called mega gardeners, and that's because they, can dis- they consume something somewhere around 300 species of, of fruits, of, of plants, and they disperse a large, a large proportion. They disperse the seeds of a large proportion of those species. They're good seed dispersers because they move the seeds long distances. So there's higher mortality of seeds and, and seedlings near the, the parent plant. And so as seed dispersers like elephants move them farther away, um, that increases their probability of, of germinating and becoming adult trees. And we also know that most of the seeds, because of the large the large gut of the elephant, um, that most of the seeds pass through the elephant's gut and therefore are capable of germinating and and reproducing. So elephants are are really important seed dispersers. If you put all these things together, you can imagine that elephants, forest elephants, have an enormous impact on their habitat, on their forests. And as as I've described before, they're changing the forest structure 
the, whether there's lots of smaller uh, stems or more or uh, more big trees. They're also probably changing the forest diversity, um, whether there's more species or less species, particularly of, of um, tropical trees. So I th- in my opinion, we know kind of the basics. We know superficially what forest elephants do to, to um, tropical forests and how they kind of structure them and structure the diversity. But we don't know in really good detail. We don't know. Um, there's a lot more to learn. And so that's, that's one of the things that we are working on. A final aspect to all of this is if forest elephants actually either plant species that are going to grow into bigger trees, have denser wood, therefore hold more carbon. And also by browsing, therefore opening up the forest so that the trees that survive can become bigger. In this way, forest elephants might actually contribute to storing carbon in in the forest. So in forests where you have forest elephants, um, there may be more more carbon because they're bigger trees and most carbon is stored in the really large trees. And so so this is one of the ecosystem services besides seed dispersal that forest elephants likely provide, which is increasing forest carbon in tropical forests. You were most recently involved in a study of forest elephant movements. Can you tell us about what that study was all about, who you did it with, what you found, and how that can help inform conservation strategies? Yeah, that's right. Um, so let me let me first bite, start by saying um, that one of the I think one of the things that's really important to learn and that um, we're trying to focus on as a lab is this idea of what happens as you mentioned what happens when when and if forest elephants are extirpated from forests or if they're completely exterminated or I'm sorry if they're complete if they go completely extinct and so part of our research is motivated by you know, what happens when you lose these really large herbivores and seed dispersers? What is that going to do to tropical forests? What is, what, um, how will that potentially impact carbon sequestration and also for the, the future forest diversity and composition in terms of species composition? So one, one aspect of that was looking at their, their movements. And so we collaborated with the Gabon Parks Agency to study uh, movements of forest elephants. And this was really an incredible study. The, the Gabon Parks Agency wanted to learn about elephant movements largely so they could know where the elephants were and how best to protect them from poaching, of course. And so starting in around 2017, um, we started a program of collaring elephants. In over about four years, we, we collared roughly 100 elephants. I think maybe it was 98 or something like that. So roughly 100 elephants, which is definitely, which is a huge number of elephants. <laughs> and I wasn't there for most of the collaring of the elephants, but um, keep in mind that this is this is a risky business. You know, you have to sneak up on a forest elephant in the forest where you can't see very well um, and dart it and then wait for, you know, a few seconds to a few minutes as the, as the elephant actually, you know, gets drowsy and falls asleep. And so it, there's considerable risk of being charged by, um, by forest elephants. So this was a really monumental undertaking. And after having, having collared all these elephants, uh, we were, we were essentially, uh, because they have satellite GPS collars, the data are basically being beamed to us, which is really fantastic. Um, and so we had one hour fixes on all these elephants and then could look at uh, how their movements were affected by all sorts of different variables. And so um, in our most recent paper, uh, we looked at the effects of climate and particular precipitation. Uh, we also looked at the, the effects of habitat and human disturbance. And our goal here was first to to figure out what are the home ranges of forest elephants, how far do they move, where are they moving, and also are there differences in their in their movement? Do some elephants um, move farther uh, than others, or are they all generally doing the same thing? And also, are there impediments to their movements? Can we can we see maybe where their their movements and their behavior are being affected by humans? or being affected by humans or human infrastructure, or whether that's not really a factor. And so the incredible thing, or the, I guess the important takeaway from this study is, first of all, we found basic information using an, an enormous, this for, for colored animals, this is really an, an enormous um, sample size, nearly 100 animals. Um, and so we got good information on home ranges and how far they move and, and that sort of thing. But the most important 
result, I think, of the of the study was determining first that precipitation was a strong motivation of elephant movements. And and we sort of suspected that. We had that's certainly the case in savannah elephants, and we'd had done some previous research that has shown that forest elephants move more when there's more precipitation. So during a dry season they'll be they'll be closer to small streams and permanent permanent water sources. And then when it starts raining they can move away from that. So even in a tropical what you think of as a lush rainforest, elephants are still limited by by water resources. We also found some effect of human activities. So where the elephant's home range was located near villages and and other or areas, I guess we use the human footprint index. So it's actually any area that has a lot of human activity. Um, We found that that reduced um, their their home range and their movements to some extent. The most important thing uh, finding though was that there was enormous variation among and between individuals in their movements. So it's really hard to say that forest elephants move this far or have home ranges of this size. And that level of individuality, probably we, should, we probably should have expected that because we know that elephants, particularly from all the work done on savannah elephants, we know they're an extremely intelligent species and they're, and they're affected by all types of factors, including the environment, precipitation, and, and resource availability and behavior, and also their own experiences. And so that's one of the, the main findings that really popped out was elephants, elephants are largely individuals. Um, they do, they kind of do their own thing. You can't expect one elephant to do the same thing as another elephant. The other thing we found, which I think is really interesting, is that we found some of the of the ways that we characterize elephant movements, like size of home range or the extent of their exploratory movements, we found that some of these behaviors were correlated. And what that means when um, elephants have correlated behaviors is that there might be behavioral syndromes, there might be personalities. And so you, we, what we identified was some elephants are what we described as idlers. Um, they move less. They have smaller home ranges. Uh, a bunch of the ways that we characterized movement were all correlated together. At the other extreme of that were explorers. So we have idlers and explorers. Some elephants don't move so much. They're not so bold. They don't go so far. Whereas other elephants have these personalities that leads them to want to explore more for whatever reason. Um, and so that was, uh, I think, a really important finding of the study. Finally, all this points to, all this has importance for conservation. One obvious conservation finding is that precipitation matters, water resources matter, and therefore if you're going to design protected areas or corridors for elephants, you need to make sure that there is plentiful water all year round, or at least when you're expecting them to move. The other finding, which is more of a challenge for conservation is that because elephants are so individualistic in their movements, it's going to be really hard to find gener- to to develop general conservation measures that's going to work for all elephants. And so that means we're going to be more we're going to need to be more creative as as conservationists in order to protect the species. It seems maybe fairly obvious that things like sex, habitat quality, and human activity would dictate where forest elephants go and what they do. But it's really interesting that you found that individual elephant personalities make a big difference in how they live their lives. Was that expected going into this study or is that a somewhat new discovery? That's a good question. And as you point out, things like sex, we, we knew that, that females would move less and have smaller home ranges than males. So that was, um, that was obvious. In general, that would be the case. And we, we had some evidence about the precipitation and, and resources and habitat quality. But no, we weren't we weren't necessarily expecting to find behavioral syndromes. And I don't think that we expected to find the level of individual variation among elephants that we, among forest elephants that we did either. I think in some respects that was a little bit naive on our part, because if you do, if you look at the, the literature on savannah elephants, obviously savannah elephants have uh, personalities and they, and they, and they, and they behave very, um, differently from one another. Um, but because we knew less about forest elephants, I, I think we had, we, we didn't necessarily go in expecting that. So that was a really, a really nice finding. And also, you know, a finding that just emphasizes the intelligence of these animals um, and the importance of, of conserving them. Because 
they really are um, extremely intelligent, extremely perceptive. Um, and in addition to being ecosystem engineers, um, they have very rich um, behavioral and cultural lives. Tell us more about how these findings can help inform conservation strategies and how the elephant's individual personalities can complicate designing conservation measures. Our findings can help design conservation measures by pointing to an emphasis on water resources. And so therefore it's gonna be really important, first of all, and I think this is, people recognize this, conservationists recognize this, it's really important to have really large landscapes for forest elephants. And it's really important that those landscapes be connected so that you can have genetic transfer between different subpopulations. And so in the development of corridors, which is certainly being considered in Gabon and other Central African countries, um, these corridors need to need to make sure that they have available water resources all year long, you know, throughout the year. And uh, they also need to be relatively um, free of really strong or intense human activity. So, for example, it might be it might be reasonable to think that you could put a corridor through a an existing and active logging concession, um, but you need to make sure that that corridor is being managed so that any logging activity that's taking place is only in part of the corridor so that there's still open space for the elephants to move and that there's there's not poaching within the corridor that there's not other types of hunting that might disturb the elephants so i think i think those are two um, measures for conservation um, that have come out of the study in terms of their their individuality i, I think that that actually makes makes this all a lot more complicated. You know, in some respects, we know elephants need large spaces. We now know how far they move and how far they can move over a year. And so if, you, if you're able to protect a corridor in a protected area, then the elephants are going, to be, are going to be fine. But one of the things that the Gabon Parks Agency really had hoped to focus on was to figure out where the large males were going. And that's because the large males, also known as big tuskers, because they have big tusks, are the ones that are more often killed by poachers um, for the, because they have lots of ivory in their tusks. And therefore, there was a real focus on how can we protect these big tuskers? Let's protect the males. Where are the males going? And I think what our research has shown is that, you know, one big tusker, one big male is not the same as another big male. And therefore, I would focus more on population or subpopulation level conservation rather than focusing on individual elephants. Just because you're not, first of all, you're not going to be able to, probably not going to be able to individually protect each male elephant. Um, But in addition to that, we can't count on one male elephant doing the same thing as another male elephant. So World Elephant Day is coming up on August 12th. What are your thoughts on how things like that help support the cause of elephant conservation? I think things like World Elephant Day are phenomenal ways to raise uh, knowledge of the plight of elephants. It's, it's funny because so many of us, particularly in the Western world, we grew up in our bedrooms as kids having you know stuffed elephants or seeing elephants as cartoon characters. And so I think there's a natural love for elephants. I think people... And to some extent, I don't know if they identify with them, but they, they s- certainly appreciate them. But I think oftentimes there's a disconnect between, you know, these, these characters, these stuffed animals that we've grown to love and the actual natural world. And so I think things like um, World Elephant Day are great for raising, raising knowledge and, about the, the plight of the elephants and the fact that they really, their populations, both savanna and in particular forest elephants, are in decline and in real danger. So I, I think things like that are really important. I think it's also important to understand that we don't know everything about elephants and that in- elephants are also closely connected to natural ecosystems like tropical forests, like savanna, like savanna ecosystems. And that those ecosystems provide us, even in the Western world, with lots of different resources and, and services, such as absorbing, absorbing carbon from, uh, from the climate. Another thing to, to understand is that it's local people in, these, in, the, in the elephant range countries that are really absorbing most of the, the difficulty of living with elephants. Um, even though elephants are these phenomenal creatures and intelligent and, and provide us with these ecosystem services, they're also highly destructive and p- impose real hardships on a lot of local people. 
particularly where there's elephant, uh, human elephant conflict and crop raiding. And, you know, elephants, even though elephants, even though Gabon is, is lucky to have this in, you know, this impressive population of forest elephants and it's such a, an impressive creature, a lot of the people in Gabon do not appreciate elephants at all because elephants go into their, into their crops, they, they destroy their crops, they sometimes do damage to their houses in, in some cases. And so anything we can do to raise, to first help these local pop, first understand that, that some people have real difficulty with, with elephants and they face real difficulties. Um, anything we can do to support them, for example, in protecting their fields against the stray elephants that sometimes wander their fields for whatever reason um, and do damage to them. I think that's really important. And also, hopefully, in addition to raising knowledge and to raising the appreciation for elephants in the Western world, hopefully this will also seep into developing countries, developing tropical countries, so that the local people who suffer from elephants also understand that um, elephants do have benefits. That's, that's not to say that we don't need to support the local people, because that's the mo- if we're going to conserve the elephant, uh, the forest elephant, we need to help local people. We need to help protect them from the damage created by elephants, particularly the crop rating. But at the same time, we need to raise knowledge and appreciation of elephants in those countries so that people view them as an animal that they're proud of rather than an animal that's a pest. If you enjoy the Manga Bay newscast, we ask that you please help spread the word by telling a friend. That's the best way to help expand our reach and keep the show growing. Another way to help is by becoming a monthly sponsor via our Patreon page at patreon.com slash manga bay. We are a nonprofit news outlet, so just a dollar or more per month would really help us with offsetting production costs and hosting fees. If you're a fan of our audio reports from Nature's Frontline, please head to patreon.com slash manga bay to learn more and support the Manga Bay newscast. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash manga bay. You and your friend can join the listeners who've downloaded the Manga Bay newscast more than a quarter of a million times by subscribing wherever you get your podcasts from. Or you can download our app for Apple and Android devices. Just search either app store for the Manga Bay newscast app to gain fingertip access to new shows and all of our previous episodes. And of course, you can read all of our news and inspiration from Nature's Frontline at mangabay.com, or if you prefer to keep up with us on social media, Follow us at facebook.com slash manga bay or on Twitter and Instagram. Our handle is at manga bay on both those platforms. Thanks as always for listening to the Manga Bay Newscast. I'm your host, Mike Gorecki, signing off. Talk to you again in two weeks.